I know you talked in other podcasts that you had like kind of like an opioid addiction addiction. So Mm -hmm. did that come with the ankle injury or was that like after you left from the military? No. So I was actually uh, prone to opiate addiction prior to the military. I'd struggled before uh, with, with opiates, um, but nothing too serious, you know, got off them, was able to join the military, all that good stuff, feeling good, but you know, it didn't come back around until that injury. And, uh, of course, once I was, you know, being prescribed opiates from the injury and put on pain Mm -hmm. management, ultimately, whenever we got back from deployment, that's where it really took off because in my mind, I had a really valid excuse for being on these strong of opiates, even though I knew in my heart that it was not a good thing for me and that I was probably going to go down a road I shouldn't go down. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, I'm like, screw this, dude. I've I've got like free access to this stuff. It's, it's a valid reason prescription, you know, the government's or the military, you know, through insurance covers the cost of it. And that's kind of what kicked it back off for me for sure. Yeah. So, I do you, so I have like my thoughts on it a little bit, but do you yeah. think that the military actually over prescribes people pain medications or whatnot? Because I because here's the reason why like I think that. So when I was when I was over in um was it launch La- La- uh, Kaiser Slotten? Um, yeah. We were at Ramstein Air Force Base where okay. and so our job was to pick pick the people up from the airplanes bring them on the bus and then bring them over to the military hospital, which was like maybe like 25 minutes away. And so it was almost like a, a, a we were like kind of like a mass unit. And so there was one dude sitting there, he was going, going to get treated. And he was like, just sitting there on like a normal chair. And he's like, Oh, I, I, I have like a lot of pain right now. And so the, the nurse that was on the, the bus decided to give him morphine. And so, and I was like, holy fuck, are you really giving him morphine right now? And he's like, mm-hmm. yeah, I, he, that's what we, that's what we give him before they get into the hospital. I was like, you gotta be what? And so I'm like, this guy is just standing here, just sitting here, like completely normal, like doesn't look like he's in pain and you give him, you give him something to, that could be something bad, like later on down the road. So I don't, I don't know. Do you, do you feel that they overprescribe that kind of stuff in the military? I think there there was a pattern of it for sure, and I think it's definitely something that um, is is easily, you know, it's a solution. It's a quick solution. You know, the, as mm-hmm. you and I both know, the military is a lot of box checking, right? You know, do this, you know, check that box, fill this form out. There's a form for everything. There's you know, there's a protocol for everything. And I think for one at one point, the protocol, and this is just my opinion, was to just handle everything medically with prescription stuff. Now, what I've learned through that though, is that especially now I think in the VA and and with the, or at least in the VA and with the opioid epidemic Mm -hmm. that kind of has become prevalent, you know, um, I think that it's caused them to pull back some, um, the other side of that, like, I think it's, I think it's harder to just, you know, go and get on this. Cause my thing was, you know, once I got back to base, it was like, all right, the medics, you know, I was having this pain, obvious injury documented from an IED blast. Their their solution was to refer me to pain management, which I had to go to a civilian doctor for. And it was the kind of same thing there. You got a pain management. They know why you're there and mm-hmm. they're going to put you on something super strong for the most part. So it definitely was an easy way for them to kind of check that box. We did our part, you know, and we handled it this way. Yeah. But I also take some of, you know, some of the responsibility for that because I knew I had a problem with opiates and I could have said something <laughs> and, and said, Hey, I don't need to be on any kind of, you know, opioid. Is there another solution? And I started, you know, obviously doing that now being sober from opiates. And I actually had to tell the VA um, after I'd gotten sober that I don't need to be on opioids. So it's in my file that unless something terrible's happened and you, there's no other solution, you know, their first remedy is to not give me opioids. So mm-hmm. yeah, part of that's the, my responsibility. <laughs> yeah. So, so do you think it's kind of like a last, last, like last ditch, ditch effort to give you like opioids if you really, really need it? Is that, or they just want to give you like ibuprofen or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I mean, there was a time where I accidentally shot a pellet, uh, like a, a 0.177 caliber, almost close to a 22, you know, air 
pellet right all the way through my toe. And this was after getting out of the military and everything, wasn't paying attention, thought the safety was on. And I w- actually went to put the safety on. It was one of those trigger safeties that's right in front of the oh, yep. stupidest design in the world. Yeah. And I was on the phone talking to somebody in this conversation. I had the barrel pointed down because there was like a roof over my head and other, other houses around. <laughs> and I was like shooting squirrels in the back. And I just pulled that trigger, man, and it shot right through my toe. And I went to the emergency room and told him, you know, I can't be on opiates. And he said, if we don't prescribe you opiates, you're going to be in some serious pain. And they did it anyway. So, you Jeez. know, <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Like when I, when I was working in the ER in Boston is like, I would see people coming in all the time for like, you know, they'll, they're like literally would circle ERs like all around like the neighborhood yeah. and just like say, Hey, I'm, I'm not feeling well. Or like, you know, and like they try to yeah. prescribe like in and, and, and it's mainly in their file too. Like, Hey, this guy goes to like all these different places too. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Like how opioids can like really get somebody to be addicted to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then the problem is that, that once the opioids aren't working enough or you're not getting them like you were through prescription and you turn to the streets, you know, and you start buying heroin or fentanyl or whatever. And that's how you get all these overdoses. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. But um, when did you really notice a pattern that it was like not going the right direction that you wanted to when you were addicted? So like when was like, did you realize it or did someone else realize it and tell you like, hey, you know, this is not really the right track. We want to see you going. No, yeah, it was a combination of a lot of things. You know, I struggled with sobriety on and off. So like I get out of the military um, and when I got out of the military, I left, you know, being prescribed to a lot of different things. And then, of course, you lose your tricare insurance and all that stuff you get out it takes there's a period took me a year to get you know everything finalized with the va before i could start using the va which is just absurd insane so i mean it's it's crazy so i start seeing you know going to civilian doctor i've got medical documents from being in an ied incident they're quick to give stuff out too and uh it just kind of continued and so i struggled you know i got in you know started kind of I got into some legal trouble, ended up, I mean, it, it was, you know, it, it went down a dark road for me. And then I found sobriety through, you know, just needing to make some changes and started going to some AA meetings and stuff like that type stuff. My problem was never alcohol or anything. It was just always opiates, you know, but found mm-hmm. a good network of people in there that understood sobriety and understood addiction and understood and kind of could help me through that process. So ultimately having some good friends and and a solid network, you know, yeah, they recognize when something's off, but when things get bad enough to where it's like, all right, I got to do something to change this, or I'm going to end up in jail or dead or what, you know, and I don't want that for myself, you know, that's for me, you know, they call it, some call it hit, you know, finding your rock bottom or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, In my experience, I've, I've found a bottom and then knocked the floor out of it and found a new (laughs) bottom and then knocked the, you know, so I don't even really like finding that bottom because what's the ultimate bottom, you know, death or life imprisonment, you know, it yeah. can lead to that. So for me, it was just things got bad enough to where I wanted to make a change. And I was I'm grateful that I had the desire to want to make a change and to want to live and to want, you know, to, to not want to live that way and to do so because not everybody feels that way. You True. know, yeah, yeah. They just think they're a, like they're perfectly OK. And then they have like a a group of people talking to them, you know, and be, they're like, no, I'm perfectly fine. And so then they, you know, keep on still using cause they think their, their life is perfectly okay. Yeah. That, or they're so miserable that they don't care. And That's true. their yeah. only solution is to end their life or to, you know, do something drastic. And, and so I was very fortunate. I consider it being very fortunate that I didn't have that desire to, to mm-hmm. want to take those kind of drastic measures. And I would, I wanted to do something about it. 